Hello and welcome to the theory recap of week 12. The first thing we're going to cover this week, or you covered this week, we covered this week in class, was the continuation of multi-degree freedom vibrations. I'm quickly going to summarize those. So for multi-DR vibrations, we discussed that if we have multiple degrees of freedom, then the vector of unknowns is generally something that looks like x1, x2, all the way to xn. And this is a vector of all the unknown generalized degrees of freedom that we have in the system. They're all functions of time. And the governing equation behind those that we can obtain either from the equation of motion or from energy, uh, sorry, which is the equation of motion to be obtained from LMB, AMB, and so forth, or the Grange equation and so forth, generally looks like this. There's a mass matrix of size n by n times x double dot plus a damping matrix, same size n by n times x dot, plus a stiffness matrix k, also of size n by n times x. And then we can have a right-hand side over here, which is the external force vector, a generally a function of time. And here, just like in the single degree of freedom case, we could, for example, have an excitation of the type f hat vector times cosine omega t, or the capital omega is the excitation frequency. And here in particular we discussed the general solution to this kind of a problem, and the solution looks like this. The x of t equals, we can do the same as for a single degree of freedom vibration, we can divide this into a homogeneous solution, x homogeneous of t plus x particular of t, where this over here is the solution of a free vibration. And this is exactly what we discussed previously, where we have to find all, you know, n eigenfrequencies, omega j, and we have n associated eigenmodes that we call x hat j. And then we have to consider the special case that if there's a zero eigenfrequency that was associated not with a real vibration, but with a rigid body mode that we saw in the eigenmode as well. This was the free vibration that we discussed previously, and what we have to do here is solve an eigenvalue problem and obtain these guys. And then we know how the system vibrates. This over here is much harder to find this particular solution. And in general, what we discussed here, what we can do is that if you have an excitation of this type, we can play the same mathematical trick as for a single degree of freedom vibration and to write this in terms of an exponential setting. And in this particular case, what we would find is that if we say that this over here can be written as some x hat star complex amplitude times e to the i omega t, again writing this as f hat star times e to the i capital omega t, we know the solution should look like this. In particular, this guy over here was given by well, plugging a general solution into this form leads to minus omega squared m plus i omega c plus k times uh, f hat star, I have to take the inverse here. And this is how we can generally find the solution. The problem is that this can hardly ever be done analytically. It has to be done numerically, and that's really the content of other higher classes that I don't want to go into here in dynamics. But this, in a way, describes everything we need to know about vibrations. Um, free vibrations, there you know, we discussed the case of free, undamped, and so forth. Um, and if we do have damping in the system, if we have excitation, we need to consider the other cases as well. That's all I want to say about vibrations for now. What we then did is we discussed a special case of dynamics, namely the dynamics of deformable bodies. And this is where we need to be a little careful. Because if we have deformable bodies, what happens out of a sudden is that we have a body that may move through space, like this can which just fell over, but it's not rigid anymore. So if you have a rigid body, it just moves like a rigid body through space, and we know how to describe rigid bodies. We've been doing this for most of the semester. Now imagine that this body moves through space while also deforming. And when it does so, we have to be very careful because now out of a sudden our velocity, angular momentum uh, transfer formula, and so forth, they don't hold anymore. Because there is not a unique angular uh, velocity anymore that links the velocity of two points. If it's deformable, then any points can move independently through space. 
not exactly independently, but they can move not like a rigid body anymore, they have much more degrees of freedom, much more freedom to move, and that's what we have to account for when we talk about deformable bodies. We discussed two types of deformable bodies, and this week in particular, we put the focus on massless deformable bodies. If they are massless, there is no mass involved, then what LMB tells us is that, as before, the sum of all forces, in particular, is, uh, you know, is zero, like in statics, because if there's no mass involved, we can go back to statics. And this allowed us to allowed us to deduce a few interesting cases that we need a lot in our dynamical systems. Namely, for example, imagine you have a rod or a bar, Young's modulus E, cross-sectional area A, and length L, and imagine you apply a force to this. If this is a massless rod, and that's what I'm assuming here, then we can in fact replace this by an equivalent spring system that's much simpler. I replace the bar by a spring to which this force F is being applied. If you apply a force, then this becomes longer by a little bit, let's call this X, right? And so if this is being stretched by X by the application of a force F, these two are related through a spring essentially, and the effective spring constant that we have here can be obtained from this system, and it's nothing else but Ea over L. And you will find this in the formula collection. So if you ever see a massless bar being stretched, you can replace it by a spring. All you have to do is make sure you use the right effective spring constant. There is an analogous situation where you have a beam of length L, Young's modulus E, area moment I, and now I apply a force F in the transverse direction. As a consequence, this beam will bend, and this deflection, a Durchbiegung, which we call W, is related to F. Because we're in statics, we can reuse the equation that we've known since mechanics too. Namely, in this particular case, we can replace this by a spring, which, if a force F is applied, is moving down by W, and the K effective in this particular case, oops, I cannot really write well down here, is 3EI over L cubed. Now, where do these numbers come from? They come from, stat from statics. They come from mechanics, too, and hopefully you remember those. If not, you can find them in the formula collection. And the third case we considered was a rod on a torsion. So if you have a rod, and instead of twisting or bending, uh, instead of uh, pulling or bending, you twist it. So you apply an angle theta here, you twist it by an angle theta, or you apply a torque M. So I essentially take a bar and I do this. In that case, what matters is again the length L, the shear modulus, shoot module G, E, Young's modulus is the A module, times J, which is the moment associated with the rigidity in this case. And what we have done is this can again be replaced by A effective spring, whose degree of freedom theta, right? if you apply theta here, or you apply torque, and these two are again related through the spring, which has a K effective of GJ divided by L. And so whenever from now on you see a massless rod, beam, or torsional rod, we can replace those guys easily by springs. And this makes things much easier because now we can, for example, imagine what happens if you put two springs either in parallel or in series. Um, this we can apply here as well. So if you have <coughs> a beam, right, which is bending, attached to a rod, which is stretching, now if this is E, I, and L, and this has E, A, and L, if this point is moving up and down, and we can easily replace this by two springs, which are put in parallel. So in this particular case, I would have this point here attached to a spring with a K effective of EA over L. But then it's also attached to another spring. And this has a K effective of 3 EI over L cubed. And if you put a mass over here, and this is a very simple system whose degree of freedom would be the motion of the particle in the middle. The K effective is the total K effective that we obtain from two springs in, in parallel. And that leads to a very simple equation of motion. So whenever we have massless bodies, we can replace them by their effective elasticity, by their effective springs. If we don't have a massless system, then things become a tiny bit more complicated. 
So, oops, wrong pen. Let's do the final case. Otherwise, if we're not massless, then the LMB is not that of statics anymore, but it's the dynamic one where we need the acceleration, we need the mass in there. And we discussed that there's in general two ways of writing LMB in this particular case. First of all, we can again say that all our external forces being applied to the system have to equal mass times the acceleration of the center of mass. It's just like before. The important point here is that this holds not only for an entire body, but also for subbodies. So if you take a large body and you cut it in half, you introduce some inner forces like you did in mechanics too, you know, inner torques and forces and so forth, then you can apply this equally to the subbody. These are the external forces applied to the subbody, and this is the acceleration of the center of mass of the subbody. So this works equally for subbodies. But there's also another version, which is the local one, and this tells us that the sum over all uh, j, derivative of the stress component ij with respect to xj, plus a body force component in the ith direction, equals the mass density rho times the acceleration a in the ith direction. And this down here is what we call the local form of linear momentum balance, which must hold at every point inside the deformable body. And from this, we discussed one special case, for example, that of an elastic bar in 1D. And if you consider an elastic bar, which is a 1D problem, things simplify a lot, because in this particular case, we know that sigma of the stress is just E Young's modulus times epsilon. And in 1D, epsilon is nothing else but U, x, where U is nothing else but the displacement field. So, to make things clear here, sigma, stress, spannig, epsilon, strain, dehnung, U, displacement, verschiebung, which essentially means if we are sitting in a bar, then at every point x, this point can be moving to the right, and this motion is what we call the displacement U of x. Right? And so, if this is the stress, if we were to plug it in here, in 1D, my derivative is just the derivative comma x, there's nothing else to do. This will be the body force in the x direction, this is the acceleration in the x direction, from which we obtain that E times u comma x, the stress. Another derivative with respect to x, comma x, plus the body force in the f direction and the x direction equals rho times the acceleration, but the acceleration is the second derivative of the position of a point which boils down to the second derivative of this displacement u. This is the local form of linear momentum balance for an elastic deformable rod, and next week we'll see that this is exactly what governs the motion of waves and the vibration of elastic rods. But with this, I'm at the end. Thanks and ciao.